A lot of you have been asking me to talk about these recent rumors about the founder of Monero, Ricardo Spagni, aka Fluffy Pony, apparently being an informant for Interpool. Wow, so this has some people in the crypto community a little bit shook because of course Monero is the favorite cryptocurrency amongst privacy advocates, cypherpunks, and most importantly, criminals. Monero is used on a lot of dark web markets, it might actually be the most popular crypto on dark web markets at this point. Uh, White House market, they famously switched to exclusively using Monero back in, I think, 2021. And they're one of the few markets, one of the few dark web markets that have been able to retire successfully. They went through their full cycle. I think they were in business for about two and a half years, and they were actually one of the most popular markets towards the end. And yeah, they didn't get shut down by the feds. They didn't get raided. Uh, they didn't exit scam. I think they gave people about two weeks or so to pull all their funds out. And nobody knows exactly how much the admins made, but it was the most popular marketplace towards the end. And we know that the admins charged a 4% commission on all transactions on the site. So I wouldn't be surprised if the amount of money that was going through that site was similar to the amount that was going through the Silk Road, which of course we know was almost $200 million. So I think it's safe to say that the admins and the people who are running a White House Marketplace, they're probably retired on a beach somewhere, living the good life. And I think a big reason for that is because they used Monero and a lot of other privacy enhancing technology on that site. Now, before we get into this Twitter thread about Fluffy Pony and whether or not he really is an Interpool informant, I just wanna let you guys know right off the top, I mean, some of you probably know this already, it doesn't matter if he's an informant for Interpool. Hell, he could be an agent for Interpool, a high-ranking agent whose only mission is to destabilize Monero. It wouldn't matter because all of the code that he's writing for Monero is open source. The Monero protocol is open source. It really doesn't matter if Fed code is being written as long as you can inspect it and check to see whether it glows or not. Okay, remember, Tor was designed by the US Navy, okay? That was designed by the feds and all dark web markets are using Tor. Lots of people are using Tor to protect their anonymity. AES, what technology or what piece of software is used more universally than the advanced encryption standard which was developed by the NSA? And even ARPANET, which was the precursor to the internet itself, was developed by DARPA. So yeah, it doesn't matter really whether or not this guy's a Fed and he's committing Fed code because we can check it and see if it glows. But let's go ahead and get into the Twitter thread. All right, so we've got our thread here by Mr. James Edwards, AKA LibreHash. Not sure how this space missed this, but the founder and lead maintainer of Monero outed himself as an informant for Interpol after he was detained by US Marshals pending extradition. Evidence strongly suggests he helped them track Monero. And we've got these screenshots of some news articles from August, 2021 and from June of 2022. Now, I point these dates out. It's important to pay attention to the timeline because all of this stuff we're gonna take a look at takes place after Ricardo stopped committing to the Monero network. Uh, so that's all the more reason why it doesn't even matter if this guy's an informant or a Fed or whatever, because he's no longer adding code to the network. But okay, let's let's get into it. So uh, this is a little bit of background about why he was in trouble. He allegedly fudged over 100K in fake invoices from his employer uh, back in 2011, and the case dragged out for years and years until uh, South Africa went and requested an extradition. And Fluffy Pony's counsel states that he was afraid to travel because of COVID-19. So yeah, I mean, whatever. He's making excuses to not <laughs> go to court. I mean, who wouldn't? Uh, let's see. So yeah, and then th this is another thing we're gonna see in this thread, which is kind of special. Uh, LibreHash, for some reason, asks for GPT-4's input a lot on this, like asking if there's layovers from a flight from Bermuda to South Africa. 
<laughs> Not sure what that's about, but it's, it's a little bit special. Uh, so this leads us to the Interpol part. The filing says that the South African prosecutors requested extradition, claiming that Spagny fled the country and ceased contact, but Spagny's counsel refutes this, citing that he's been in interaction with Interpol the whole time. Uh, and then we have, yeah, so this is uh, just more screenshots of those filings. Yeah, and it says that he was helping them with an Interpol matter in March 2021. So several months after he stopped working on the Monero project. Which, hey, maybe that's why he stopped working on the Monero project, right? I mean, it would be a conflict of interest, right? I mean, just, just this has uh, created a bit of a stir. Imagine if an Interpol informant was actively committing to Monero. Oh my gosh. Uh, so let's see, this is... Email exchange between Colonel uh, and the advocate. Okay, so this is between his lawyer and a Fed <laughs> or someone who works for a Fed. And so he's his uh, lawyer is forwarding his information to the Fed so that they can trace Monero transactions or whatever. And yeah, so here's where we get what this, so this is an MLA, right? UK MLA request. MLA means mutual legal assistance, and they only hit you up for one of three things, either statements and interviews, evidence on oath or in court, or for help with asset tracing. So this is our smoking gun here. This is what we're really concerned about, that Fluffy Pony is in contact with Interpol, helping them trace Monero transactions. But here's the thing, the feds really don't even need Fluffy Pony's help with tracing Monero or figuring out any weaknesses Monero has because they could just watch the Breaking Monero playlist. Look at this. Hours of content that are just all about weaknesses that Monero has had over the years, uh, weaknesses that it still has and ways that users can try to protect themselves from those weaknesses and also ways that the devs, things that the devs have planned uh, and that they talk about. You can also see that in the, uh, I believe they call it the Monero workgroup talks, uh, ways that they might be able to improve the network. But yeah, this, covers, I would imagine, just about anything that Ricardo could tell the feds in terms of weaknesses Monero has. Um, like, well, this wouldn't have been in 2021, but early in Monero's history, ring sizes were not fixed. You could use any ring size you wanted to, but it turns out this is a, a bit of a weakness for privacy because if you happen to know somebody uses, say, a ring size of 69, then you can look at the Monero network and anytime I see a ring size of 69, I know that that's your transaction. So yeah, the weaknesses and limitations of Monero, I think, are pretty public and uh, let's see, yeah, all of, the, all of these videos were published before Ricardo even apparently had these interactions with Interpol. Um, and, and look at this, even GPT-4 <laughs> thinks that Ricardo's a Fed, right? Given that Spagny is the founder and lead maintainer of Monero, a cryptocurrency that is known for its privacy and anonymity features, it's possible that his expertise was sought by the South African authorities in relation to tracing assets or investigating financial transactions that involve the use of cryptocurrency. Founder and lead maintainer of Monero. Okay. But when I look at contributors, it tells me he was the former lead maintainer. Could it be that GPT-4's facts are wrong? Not the heckin' AI. Did, did GPT-4 watch Breaking Monero? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Uh, and okay, yeah, so he's saying, you know, oh, it's, it's not asserting a fact, it's making an inference on the basis of objectual factual info it was given. But I mean, I guess you didn't give it factual info, though, because he's not actively the maintainer. But whatever, we're splitting hairs at that point. Let, let's get into something juicy. Uh, so this just, again, talks about how MLA does include tracing cryptocurrencies. I mean, yeah, of course it does. 
Um, perhaps unrelated is the fact that I exposed my Monero was a wallet that stole funds. Okay, so this is a separate thing that uh, we might talk about in this video as well, but allegedly there's some Monero that Ricardo worked on, which also stole money from people and it didn't actually host the full node locally. But I don't think that was ever even a wallet that was really recommended by the Monero project. I mean, the Monero project recommends Monero CLI and the Monero GUI, not my Monero. So yeah, obviously if you're using a bugged wallet, uh, it might steal funds from you or de-anonymize you, but that really doesn't have anything to do with the Monero protocol itself. Uh, also, for those that are wondering, at the time, Fluffy Pony was contacted by Interpool to provide them with assistance with something only applicable query that he has any relative expertise in equals asset tracing. Well, okay, yeah. So they most likely reached out to him for help with tracing assets. There's no surprise there. And so here <clears throat> we have a little bit of a uh, excerpt from an academic paper. And I believe this was also covered on breaking Monero. I'm not sure which episode it was, but you should listen to the entire playlist if you're going to be using Monero. Uh, so this talks about a theoretical way that an adversary would attack the Monero network, uh, specifically how an adversary would attack ring signatures. So for those of you that don't know, whenever you transact in Monero, your transaction, when someone's analyzing it, it looks like it could have come from, uh, well now, one of 16 different people, but at this point, ring size were only 11, so it could have come from one of 11 different people. So there's your true signature, right, the person who's truly sending the money, and then there's, at this point, it would have been 10 other decoy addresses that uh, appear to be spending. So a way that an adversary could try to counteract this is by creating a whole bunch of Monero addresses themselves, funding those Monero addresses with just some Monero, and then having all of them start sending to other wallets that they control on the network. Uh, because the way that rings are chosen for Monero is not completely at random. There's a little bit of optimizations. And this is another thing that changes over time as Monero is optimized, because of course it's software, it's a protocol, it, it gets changed and improved over time. Um, but for the sake of making things simple, we'll just say that these 10 addresses are randomly chosen. Well, if you are creating a bunch of addresses and you are making them transact on the Monero network, that increases the chance that your addresses are gonna be the ones chosen at random. And so now, when you're analyzing transactions on the Monero network, if you're a Fed who's trying to, uh, I don't know, trace some unlicensed pharmaceutical <laughs> entrepreneurs, um, then you can look and if a transaction comes up and five of the addresses are yours, bam, you can automatically eliminate those five as the true spends. And now you only have, uh, well, at this point it would have been six real addresses. Um, it's very expensive to do that because you have to create addresses, you have to buy Monero, uh, you have to run wallets and you have to run these on separate computers. Like it's, it's a lot of work to actually do something like this. And like I said, the ring sizes keep getting larger. As the ring sizes of Monero grow, this becomes harder and harder to do because you're gonna have to spam more and more addresses to become a larger part of that. Um, and even here, I think they say that they were only able to demask about 50%. Like, let's say, see, okay, in this scenario, in the same way as the first one, we can conclude that a shorter attack duration is more cost effective. Unlike the first strategy, however, the majority of transaction inputs have their anonymity set reduced by eight and nine, leaving the attacker with a 33% and 50% chance of guessing the real input respectively. So even after doing all of this, it's only given them at best a 50% chance of figuring out if any, of de-anonymizing any specific transaction on the network. And another thing that is talked about in Breaking Monero to counteract this, and this was back before the ring size was increased, which of course makes it all the more powerful, is churning. 
So churning, and I think uh, this guy over here was mentioning it. Um, but anyway, I'll just explain it. So churning is basically where you are sending your funds to these intermediate wallets. It's a, it's a similar thing that people do with mixing on Bitcoin networks, right? Where you just send the Bitcoin to a whole bunch of different wallets. You know, you're creating all of these transactions, all this noise on the network to make it harder to trace. Well, with Monero, each and every time you do that, there's 15 fake signers that are being added. So each time you churn, your anonymity set with Monero increases exponentially. And then there's proposed improvements to the protocol like Seraphis, which would completely make it impossible to even do this kind of attack against Monero, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Um, okay, so then at the end he says, yeah, maybe it's overblown, but possibly it isn't. Now, I think it's only fair that I read Ricardo's replies to all of this. So at no point have I ever met with and or helped a law enforcement agency or a government or an individual or a government agency or a company or anyone to trace Monero. I remain willing and excited to point any requester in the direction of resources like Breaking Monero series published by the Monero community and researchers because I can do nothing beyond that. So in his own words, he's saying that he doesn't have any secret back doors, any secret tricks to trace Monero beyond what anyone who has Monero and uses Monero should know about already. Monero is based on a very well-established cryptography. The code base has been battle tested. Yeah, I have no ability to provide any government agency with anything beyond this information. I have no privileged access to Monero's code, GitHub repo, website, Twitter account, DNS record, donated funds, or anything else. At my insistence, my access to things like Monero code base will never be restored. Uh, we've got a screenshot of this and uh, I'm not gonna go over this whole thing, but I guess it probably just explains why he doesn't have access to it anymore. I'm beyond disappointed that I have to even write this thread. The accusations of a known scammer are clearly nonsensical and should not need refuting. I am grateful to all have pointed out the glaring flaws in the original thread. I am disappointed in those who amplified what was clearly nonsense and I literally could not care less about the handful who acted with great uh, schadenfreude? <laughs> I have no idea what that is, uh, and let their own biases embarrass them thin. So yeah, Fluffy Pony being a glowy looks like a big nothing burger to me. Now, let's uh, take a look at this. It's a little bit more interesting, right? My Monero is a wallet client for Monero provided by Fluffy Pony and other members of the core development team for Monero. This wallet saved all users' private keys and public key pairings on server. That is not good. And it also stole countless Monero from users. Wow, these are some pretty bold claims that this guy's making. Now, he apparently has proof of all of this on his website. Um, there's just one little problem though. Your website doesn't work, okay? So I don't know what's going on with that. If you're, you know, maybe being DDoSed by a bunch of Monero bros right now, but that's something you might wanna look into instead of, you know, shit posting on Twitter, you might wanna fix your website. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I'll just read the rest of this thread. Uh, let's see, and then yeah, he explains Monero. We don't need this, we know how Monero works. Uh, let's get to where we actually explain what happened. Okay, so he explains the technical stuff. I'll just give you a quick TLDR. My Monero doesn't download the whole blockchain, okay? Now, when you use Monero, we recommend that you actually download the blockchain to your uh, computer or to your device and you run a node yourself because that is the most private way to use Monero. Um, and this wallet isn't even a recommended wallet. I don't think it ever has been on getmonero.org. Um, so yeah, and then he basically just explains that, how it's better to download the whole blockchain and when you don't do that, you have to put a lot of trust in the server. 
Uh, now, here's where I think we start getting into issues, right? So there's no HTTPS connection that's being made. Instead, it's using WebRTC to the My Monero server. So no ability to authenticate with said server or be sure one is not victim of a man in the middle attack. Okay, so that's a little bit concerning, I guess, if you're using My Monero. Um, let's see, issue two, AES and CBC mode, doesn't matter since my Monero controls the encryption decryption keys stored on their server, not the user. In this context, Monero plus blockchain should be assumed privacy can be feasibly destroyed here at least. And so we've got more screenshots of problem code from my Monero. And let's see, wallets, RPC method.js, in the source code is the first major red flag and weak link. Don't take my words for this though. Let's examine the code in the following tweets. Don't worry, all the code is thoroughly explained. Basically saying that your private view and spend keys are stored on the server and your transaction history is also stored on the server. So if you're using the My Monero wallet, your privacy is more comparable to Bitcoin, which is not really any at all. And towards the bottom here, we've got a response from one of the developers. So for anyone who's actually concerned about this thread, I don't know James, but I'm the sole and original author of the My Monero RPC server repo he's tweeting about. James, you're completely off base about so many things. Are you trolling people? I'll address a few things. Um, so keep in mind here that all of this code that we've been looking at so far is for the My Monero RPC server, okay? Keep that name in mind. The My Monero RPC server repo was never meant to be deployed. It was a little thing I had whipped up over a couple of days to demo to enterprise customers already using the official Monero RPC client that they didn't have to change so that they didn't have to change their code to be able to use My Monero scanning system. As far as I know, no one ever used the My Monero RPC server, nor, and it was built purely to demonstrate how to use the new efficient WebSocket based API to My Monero system, client, and server, which I designed and fully implemented with the help of my C dev at My Monero. All right, and then we've got James here saying that I can't dispute what you're saying, but can't confirm either since the My Monero source code is not published. Correct me if I'm wrong. In lieu of available source code, the best outlook one can have of My Monero equals black box. And then of course, this guy tells him he's wrong because My Monero source code is published. Okay, if we look up My Monero GitHub, we click this little link right here, Oh, look at this, my Monero account on GitHub with all their repos. So we've got the My Monero desktop, an app that people might actually have used, which was not the application that uh, LibreHash was looking at. We've got My Monero mobile. Again, another thing that people might actually use, but not the app that LibreHash was auditing. I believe it was, uh, no, not this one either. This is the WebJS. Let's see if we can find that RPC that he was uh, looking at. Okay, here we go. My Monero RPC server. This experimental project was never implemented. Okay, so it's an experimental project. There's there's three stars on GitHub. There's two watching, there's four forks. Nobody is using this. So like, again, I have no idea what this James Edwards at LibreHash guy is on about if he's just out here trying to FUD Monero or what, uh, but it really doesn't matter whether the, lead developer who doesn't even develop an arrow anymore is a glowy or not uh and don't use wallets that are not recommended by the cryptocurrency project don't use my monero i guess use the monero gui or use monero cli